Hello and welcome to the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation's presentation of Meet Your Microbiome. The Canadian Digestive Foundation is here for you. Helping you achieve optimal gum-to-bum health is why we exist. We have one of the most robust websites on digestive health and disease, and we encourage you to visit us at www.cdhf.ca. Here you will find educational guides, videos, presentations from healthcare professionals, and of course, recorded sessions like tonight's Meet Your Microbiome online web seminar. The Foundation would like to thank the Activity Group at Danun for sponsoring this event with an unrestricted educational grant. Without their support, this session would not be possible. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Richard Fedorik. Dr. Fedorik is President of the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation, and he is past President of our parent organization, the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. Welcome, Dr. Fedorik. Well, thank you, Catherine, and uh, welcome to all of you listening in this evening. We're uh, pleased to have you here, and hopefully we can uh, learn a little bit uh, together about this very new part of uh, science called uh, the human um, microbiome. Um, hopefully by the end of this evening, I've got a couple of objectives to talk to you about. I want you to be able to understand the human microbiome. Um, I actually want you also to learn how you can protect and enhance your own microbiome, um, things that you can take, foods that you can eat. I want you to explore the three P's of personalized care, and we'll cover that right towards the end. And then also learn a little bit about how an unhealthy microbiome can affect uh, your health. So it may be that you've never heard of the word microbiome. Well, Scientists have recently begun to understand that the bacteria that are in our gut, in our intestines, both our stomach, our large intestine, our small intestine, are incredibly important to our health, and that changes in that can lead to disease. And it's led to an entire new era of science and also to a new era of us being able to seek out and find new medicines. So to go right back to the beginning, as Catherine said, today we're talking about the gut microbiome from gum to bum. And microbiome, another word that you may want to substitute for that or be more familiar with is, is bacteria. So the bacteria in your gut, all the living organisms in your intestine really make up that microbiome. And these bacteria, this microbiome, there's a hundred and 100 trillion of them, that's a large number. And they together uh, are important in working to keep you healthy. In fact, there are 10 times more bacteria in your intestine than there are your own individual body cells. So if you think about that, 10 times more bacteria than there are of all your individual body cells. And if you just look at your skin, how many cells make up your skin and your, and your heart and your lungs? Imagine 10 times more bacteria. So there's a lot of them, point to take home. So what does it do? What does this microbiome do? So it's not just something that you have and you poop out on a regular basis, but the microbiome is very important in digestion. Without bacteria, you actually cannot digest your food, your food. We've also learned that the microbiome can influence your mood and energy levels. And we've learned that elderly people, for instance, have a change in their microbiome and that some of that change can lead to some of the memory loss and to some of the decreased energy that uh, elderly people can, uh, can um, experience. Imagine as science moves forward in five or ten years that we learn what those bacteria are that have changed in the elderly and perhaps be able to increase our energy and memory as an elderly person. An exciting opportunity. But more importantly, these microbiome also help to protect us against harmful organisms. So without that microbiome, any of the food that you eat, any of the experiences that you may pick up bacteria as you're walking through the mall or as you've touched something, 
um, we'd all end up with food poisoning and be sick and nauseated every day if we didn't have the microbiome to protect us. Now, there are many factors. Each one of you have a different fingerprint on your finger. So look at your finger. You've got a fingerprint. It's different than the person next to you. Well, isn't it interesting that each of your microbiome, like your fingerprint, is different than the person next to you? So we all have a unique microbiome. And we've established that microbiome partly because of genetics. We have different genes than one another because of the environment we live in, what we eat, what, where we've grown up, the pets and animals we've had, the environment we lived in. And it's normally in a balance. And when it's in a balance, you're healthy. And when it becomes unbalanced, you become unhealthy. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So I told you your microbiome is like your fingerprint. So at birth, each of you had no bacteria living in your gut. You were, your intestine was essentially sterile with no bacteria. And then as you were born, and the first couple of years of life, as all of those people took care of you and they kissed you and they hugged you, they passed their bacteria onto you. And you gradually formed your own microbiome made up of this mix of all of these bacteria that you were exposed to as a child, as an infant the crawling on the floor, the licking of the dog, all of those things that you might have did helped establish your microbiome. And the healthy bacteria lived, of course, and anything that was dangerous didn't live. And so you established this very unique fingerprint of a, of a microbiome as a child. And the most important thing about the microbiome that we've learned in the last two or three years here in science is that it has to be diverse. Now, what does that mean? That simply means that there has to be many different types. If you only had one type of bacteria, you would be sick. If you had two types, you'd be sick. You have to have millions and millions and trillions of different types of bacteria to be healthy. My analogy I use is a forest. A healthy forest is a forest that has many different types of plants and animals and trees in it. And if you only have a forest that has one type of tree, and then imagine that tree gets infected, then all those trees are dead, and the forest is dead. But if you had many different types of trees, and one of them got infected, you still have a lively forest, because there's many different types available. And diversity in your microbiome is the same. With many different types of bacteria, you remain healthy. And this microbiome that you have strives for this balance. It wants to maintain this diversity, maintain all these different types. And if it does, you remain healthy. And you see on the right-hand side of this slide, says an unbalanced microbiome. It can lead to infection, inflammation, illness, and susceptibility to disease. And so we have learned that if, if your microbiome gets altered and doesn't recover, isn't able to recover, you will get some of these things happening, infection, inflammation, illness, and be susceptible to disease. And so again, I tell you that science is looking into this and figuring out why does people microbiome become abnormal? And when it does, how can they fix it so that people can remain healthy? Now, you can do things to help your, yourself. So I've told you up to this point the microbiome is all the bacteria in your gut and that there's many different types of it and that it needs diversity and it needs to be balanced. And if it gets out of balance, you're going to be sick. There are things that you can do to help yourself. Now, you can support your microbiome. Um, and the more experience that you have, the more, uh, particularly as a child, the more bacteria you've been exposed to, we're now learning that that's an important uh, factor to keep you healthy because you've actually developed a larger diversity of your microbiome. But you want to stay away from things that can change your microbiome 
in a negative way. So when you take antibiotics, you kill off a lot of your bacteria in your gut, and hopefully they will recover. But if they don't, as you know, some people may get sick from taking antibiotics. Some of you may have taken antibiotics and got diarrhea. That's because you've changed your microbiome. Also, poor diet. And this comes into the elderly. The elderly that don't eat a well-balanced diet, don't eat a diversity of foods, different uh, types of foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, they too will have a microbiome that becomes less diverse and less healthy. And also, every time you're sick, every time you take medication, you have potential to alter your microbiome. And we're now learning that all of these things taken together can actually be harmful to an individual. Now, I'm going to change topics a little bit because I'm going to talk about things that you can do to help fix your microbiome. So let's say that you you got an infection in your, in your arm or your finger and you have to go on antibiotics. Okay, you have to go on antibiotics. You can't prevent that. And you know that you're going to destroy your microbiome to some degree by those antibiotics. So how can you, what can you do at home to naturally try and keep your microbiome healthy? Well, there's things called prebiotics and probiotics. And let's cover some of these. So probiotics are just live microorganisms that when you take them in, help your own microbiome live better. And there are supplements. You can go to a health food store or a drug store and pick up probiotic supplements. So particularly if you're taking antibiotics, probiotic supplements can help maintain your own microbiome and ensure that you don't get unbalanced or ill. And when you take these probiotics, Pictured here, you can see before probiotics, you've only got a few of these circled yellow bacteria, which are the good guys that are helping to keep you healthy. And after the probiotics, you can see so many more of those little circles in red circling those yellow bacteria, which are the healthy ones. So probiotics help to improve your microbiome. But unfortunately, probiotics are not permanent. Once you stop taking your probiotic supplement, you gradually will revert back to this unhealthy state shown on the right-hand side there where there's less of these good, healthy bacteria. So why do you want to take probiotics? Well, particularly to try and increase your microbiome diversity to help keep you strong healthy, and resilient to infection. So to this point, I just want to summarize to say that we've talked about the microbiome and how important it is in the diversity and keeping you balanced, and that if it gets out of balance, you can now do something about it by taking probiotic supplements to help build up that microbiome back into a healthy state, keep you strong, healthy, and resilient. Now I want to switch to something called prebiotics, something else you can do at home. So prebiotics is simply food for the probiotics. So you can actually feed your own bacteria and help them grow up into normal, healthy bacteria. And these prebiotics occur in any number of grains, fermented foods such as um, yogurts and milks, honey, and fibers and starches. So the old adage to have a bran muffin a day is not only providing you that bran, but is also feeding the gut and feeding your microbiome because bran is a prebiotic. And your own bacteria within the gut love to eat that bran muffin as much as you do. And when they do that, they spur growth of your microbiome and growth of good bacteria. So I've told you now that to help maintain your microbiome in a healthy state, you can take probiotic supplements that you can pick up at a drugstore or a health food store. And the foods you eat that contain grains and fibers help 
maintain your microbiome by providing prebiotics or food that your microbiome can eat. But I have to give you one little caution in that these prebiotics or the probiotics particularly, they're not yet regulated. And so you have to be careful of what you purchase from a health food store or a drug store. You need to ask that pharmacist or ask that health food director exactly what is in that bottle, whether they're effective bacteria, and you should check with them also to be sure that you're using these probiotics for the right reason. So speak to a healthcare professional, doctor, pharmacist, dietitian, about which of these probiotics or prebiotics that you should use for your situation. And let me give you a few examples. So maybe you're going to be going on antibiotics for this infection. Speak to your doctor, pharmacist, or dietitian and figure out how you can supplement your microbiome so it stays healthy. Or maybe you've had a bad flu, a cold, and you've been ill for a while, and your bowels haven't returned back to normal because the microbiome has been affected by this virus. Again, ask your doctor, pharmacist, or dietitian how you can supplement and improve your microbiome. We like to be sure that the probiotics that you buy are alive. You need to check the labels, ensure that the labels say active or live culture, and you also need to be sure you're picking up a probiotic with the best before date. There's lots of other information. The Canadian Digestive Health Foundation, for one, has lots of information on probiotics where you can go to. It's credible. And also, it's updated frequently because science is moving very quickly in this field. And we've learned a lot in the last two years regarding the microbiome and how it affects your body and how you can maintain it and stay healthy. Is the microbiome mainstream medicine? Well, it is. It's getting there. And here's the three P's of personalized care and how they apply to your microbiome. Predicting what might go wrong. My example of the antibiotics is going to kill your microbiome to some degree and you're going to lose that diversity. How you can protect it. We've learned that you can use probiotics or prebiotics. And these things can be prescribed in order that you don't get sick from taking those antibiotics, as an example. So in the future, scientists are beginning now to look at the microbiome to help, pre help predict disease. So we can take a simple culture from your intestines, look at it, and perhaps in a few years, we should be able to predict, oh, this person is likely to have diabetes. This person is likely to have high blood pressure because of their microbiome. Yes, as astonishing as it may seem, diabetes may be in part related to changes that occur in the microbiome. Same as with obesity. We're now learning that some obese people may be obese because their microbiome has been altered early on as a child. Imagine if we could fix that problem with obesity by just changing the microbiome. In the future, we're going to be able to protect, protect you by identifying what's wrong in your microbiome and then replacing it appropriately so you stay healthy. I'll tell you an interesting study that's gone on in Ireland where they took a number of elderly people in a nursing home who were low energy, memory was failing, and they changed those individuals' microbiome. And those, in, those individuals in that nursing home, by all measurements, had significantly more energy and, more astonishingly, improved their memory. So imagine using the microbiome, just changing the bacteria in your gut, changing how a person feels and thinks. 
and again in the future, and even here in Edmonton and across Canada, we've been doing uh, clinical trials looking at whether we can treat specific diseases such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative disease with changing the microbiome. And in many cases, we've been successful. So again, in the future, you may go to the drugstore and pick up a prescription for a certain bacteria in order to treat one of your diseases. That's not too far in the future. So we've come a long distance now, and we have some time for questions, but we've covered the fact that your body inside your intestine is made up of the microbiome, trillions of bacteria that like to be diverse, that when they become unbalanced can lead to disease, and you can fix that disease and help maintain that balance with probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics being supplements of good bacteria and prebiotics being grains and foods in which the good bacteria can eat and grow with. So with that, I'm going to stop and have a chance to answer any questions. Okay, Catherine, that's... I'll turn it back to you at this point. Yeah, wonderful uh, introduction. And I know that uh, people are... Uh interested in, in, uh, in understanding some new things that you've uh, pointed out here because some of the questions here are pretty cool. So um, I'm going to combine a few of them together so that we can get through them all. But uh, the first group is really, um, are, probiotic, are probiotics safe? Can I take too many? And what steps should be taken by my doctor before they can make a suggestion on which ones I should take to affect my microbiome? Uh, good. There's three questions there. I hope I remember them all. Are probiotics safe? Yes. Um, we believe that as long as you're taking probiotics that are available through a drugstore or a health food store, um, they are safe. Can you take too many? Yes. Uh, you need to not take any more than those directed uh, on the bottle uh, of probiotics. Just like any medicine, don't take more than you should. Take just the right amount. And my dear Catherine, I have forgotten the last question already. So the other one was, what steps should I think should I need a memory probiotic to help me there. <laughs> I'm sure there's one out there. Um, the final question in that little group was, what steps should the doctor be taking um, before they make suggestions on what specific probiotic a person should be taking? So that, that really depends on why you want to take uh, the probiotic. And um, Doctors uh, have guidelines and literature around uh, pro certain probiotics that work for certain disorders. So if you want to take a general probiotic for your health, that might be one type of probiotic. If you want to take a probiotic to prevent antibiotic-induced diarrhea, that's another probiotic. If you have a disease such as ulcerative colitis, that may be another probiotic. So you need to attend your doctor talk to them about probiotics and be sure that he or she is um, uh, aware of this changing field of science and giving you the right probiotic for the reason that you're looking for. Okay, great. And then sort of on the flip side of that, um, Helen is asking if we shouldn't be trying to reduce the bad bacteria by using something like an antifungal. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. So. Um, the, there, are, there are various types of uh, funguses mixed in with all of our bacteria in our, in our gut. Um, but all of the science that we have been uh, doing to this point um, would suggest that it's much more effective to try and increase the good bacteria than to try and identify that, that one bacteria that may be injurious because your body manages that balance itself. Your body is always looking to increase the number of good bacteria to prevent those bad bacteria from, or, or bad fungi or bad yeasts from colonizing you. And okay. so if, for instance, you were colonized with a bad bacteria, um, still the only way to completely get rid of it is to increase the number of good bacteria that can then fight off that bad bacteria. It's okay. the way in which uh, 
that balance is maintained. Okay. And then Carol's asking, what pro probiotic is recommended for general good health, and should I be taking one every day? Well, you know, probably for good general health, the best probiotics that you can take um, are available in the yogurt section of your uh, local grocery store. So uh, you need to be to know, though, that not all yogurt has uh, live probiotics in it, and you need to look at uh, yogurts that have individual um, supplemented uh, probiotics. And uh, the Danone uh, Activia yogurt is one of those that has a, a culture bacteria, a probiotic that's been shown to be good for digestive health. And taking uh, one yogurt a day is uh, going to provide that balance that you need and help maintain that balance uh, in your body. Okay. Um, just another general question. Does it matter when I take the probiotic? Morning, night, with food, without food? Yeah, that's, that's another uh, good question. I don't think it matters <coughs> when you take the probiotic. I think it's important that you take enough of the probiotic. So if you're taking it in a capsule form with a supplement, be sure you're reading the instructions. Uh, if you're taking it uh, for general health, uh, as a yogurt, then, uh, you know, make sure you're having a full uh, daily serving as identified on the package of that yogurt. Okay. Um, so Darren is saying that we talked about using only live uh, or probiotics that only contain live bacteria. Does this mean that people shouldn't use the probiotics that are in capsule form? Well, that's interesting. So many of those uh, probiotics that are in capsule form uh, are what we would consider uh, uh, live. Some of them are actually live. Other ones have been uh, what we call lyophilized or freeze-dried. Um, and as soon as they're exposed to, um, uh, you know, your body, inside your body, with a warm temperature, with uh, food, to, food to eat, they'll immediately grow up. Uh, what we want to avoid is taking those that are, are, are dead, and even when you put them inside your body, they won't grow. So um, when we say active probiotic in a capsule, that usually means that they are freeze-dried and ready to grow at the moment you take them. Okay. I have a question here. I'm not sure that we can actually answer it tonight, but if we can't, I think we can probably um, add it to our website later on. But I'll throw it out there because you are always such a wealth of information. Um, so Jenna is asking, do we know specifically which naturally fermented foods and sources of probiotics are beneficial for which ailments? The answer is we don't know that yet. Uh, we are striving to find out um, that information. Um, we are working hard with diseases uh, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis because those we know and better understand the change in the microbiome. Uh, we are working with various infections, traveler's diarrhea, uh, there's diarrhea, uh, an infection called C. difficile diarrhea. We're working with that. Uh, we are working in diabetes and obesity, I mentioned to you. Um, those, that science is still several years behind us having a pill or fiber or food or probiotic or prebiotic to treat those disorders. But stay tuned, watch this website, uh, listen to these new webinars as they come along and uh, we'll keep you up to date on that. Okay, great. Um, so the next one is, what's the difference between a probiotic that has a bacteria and one that is yeast? Yeah, so uh, there are a few yeast uh, bacteria, Saccharomyces boulardii, or, or one called Floristar is its trade name, and it's, uh, it's been effective to prevent a certain type of infection. Um, <coughs> and again, that's where science is moving to identify um, specific probiotics. It's, it's a particular yeast that's been cultured from Europe. It seems to be very healthy um, for this one particular 
uh, disorder uh, that occurs as a consequence of uh, taking uh, large amounts of back, uh, antibiotics, usually in a hospital. Um, most of the probiotics that have been uh, developed, studied, used, uh, contain uh, healthy bacteria or good bacteria, Catherine. Okay, great. Um, and just we just touched on antibiotics there. Uh, someone is asking, can I or should I take a probiotic at the same time that I'm taking an antibiotic? Uh, for the most part, the probiotic uh, will be killed off by your antibiotic. So um, it's most important that you, uh, you, you can. It's probably just not going to be as effective. You'll probably want to take that probiotic immediately before your antibiotic and then uh, for sure for uh, a month after your antibiotic to repopulate your, back, your body with the good bacteria. Okay. So we have a few people um, who are joining us tonight who obviously have either ulcerative colitis um, or Crohn's disease, so inflammatory bowel disease. So there's a few questions that are related to that. The first one is, what's the status of fecal microbiota transplant for ulcerative colitis in Canada? Is this an option that will be available to us in the next few years? So the question uh, is about fecal transplants. So really that is just uh, fecal transplants uh, are taking uh, fecal material from um, a donor and uh, making sterilizing it and then uh, putting it, uh, re replacing it into someone's large intestine, uh, usually by a colonoscopy. So that's currently an experimental procedure uh, that uh, is in clinical trials and should not be done despite what the internet says uh, outside of a major hospital running that as a clinical trial. Uh, you wouldn't want to take an experimental drug at home without some uh, guidance and it being involved in a trial and you wouldn't want to do a fecal transplant at home with uh, as in, in, a, in, in converse to what the internet says you should do. So don't do that. Okay. And the other one that's related to IBD is, is there a specific probiotic that we can take proactively to try and help counter the symptoms of IBD? So the most studied probiotic in inflammatory bowel disease is one called VSL number three. It's available at your pharmacy. Um, so that's the most studied bacteria, a uh, probiotic in, in uh, inflammatory bowel disease and the one that you can uh, try to see whether it will help your symptoms. It won't cure the disease. You still need to be on your medication, but it can help lessen some of the symptoms. Okay. And again, another one that's disease-specific from Maureen is she's asking, does chronic pancreatitis have any effect on the microbiome, or is there a remedy or solution that's related to, to probiotics or prebiotics that we can use? Uh, the answer, and a short answer is uh, no, uh, and we don't understand that completely. You should check with your doctor, but in general, if you have chronic pancreatitis, you don't have the right digestion happening, so you're likely to have some change in the microbiome. And, you know, uh, replacing it with a good yogurt probiotic or a supplement is probably not going to hurt you and will probably be a good thing, but it's not going to fix your pancreatitis. Okay. And the last one that's disease-specific, and, again, I'm not sure that you'll be able to answer this one because it's, it's not really related to GI, or sorry, to gastroenterology, but um, Joshua is asking if there is some kind of direct correlation between autism and the microbiome. Um, as you know, there's been lots of speculation, mainly on the Internet, that everything from sunspots to measles causes autism. Uh, there is no evidence that, you know, the microbiome or changes in the microbiome cause uh, autism. So um, I think you need to be very careful about making that connection. Okay. So there's two questions left. And one's a little tricky, so let's, let's do that one first and we'll end on a, a simpler one. Um, so if probiotics do not naturally colonize in the gut, then it seems that they are not a natural part of it. 
Can you explain um, why that would be? Let me tell you about all of the probiotics that are currently available have, uh, have been cultured for the most part from us, humans, and have been identified over the years to be uh, beneficial to health and then through extrapolation through science have been, uh, are looking into whether they can help individual diseases. So these bacteria that you buy as probiotics really have originally come from us, from a human, one of the, or two of the uh, hundred trillion that we have. And clearly in that hundred trillion bacteria that we all have, there's going to be many, many more good probiotics that science has to pull out, discover, and find out how they can help disease. So they are natural. They do come from us. Okay. And, and is it correct to assume then that it's just in some people, for whatever reason, that particular bacteria will not stay healthy and growing and populated? Well, as I said, everybody has different fingerprint. And so it may be that, uh, let's call probiotic number one, you were never ex as good and healthy for you, but in your growing up, you were never exposed to probiotic number one. You never found it. You never saw it. You never, so it never grew in your intestine, so you don't have it. Okay. And, and you're lacking it. And so by taking that supplement, we'll help bring it back for you as long as you're taking that supplement. And last one, does it matter how many strains the probiotic that I'm taking has? Well, that's a really good question. So we're, uh, it seems that you need to have at least a minimum number of probiotics, and so that's why reading the label is really important. So if you just took, imagine you just took one single bacteria, that's going to probably be destroyed in your stomach, and it's not going to help you. So you need millions and millions of them to get through the stomach, and, and, and uh, so the, that's important to read those, uh, those labels. I, I didn't tell you, but for the most part, the stomach doesn't have any bacteria. Stomach acid is too strong, and so all of this microbiome is in your small and large intestine. And okay. that's where it needs to stay, and that's where it does a good thing. Okay. Is there a competition between the types of probiotics that you're taking while you're taking different medications? Um, no, generally, if you're, say, taking a medication uh, for whatever disorder and you then start taking your probiotic, those probiotics will start growing. They'll be up there in, in sufficient numbers to be healthy and helpful to you in about seven days, and they will last as long as you're taking those probiotics. And about seven days after you've stopped taking them, those probiotics will gradually die out because they need to be fed to you every day. Okay. Great. You, I, want to, I want to make the important point that, you know, once you form that fingerprint of a microbiome as a child, it doesn't change, and it's impossible to change it. It's like your fingerprint. You made that fingerprint, it ain't going to change, and your microbiome is like that. So you have to live with whatever you were born with and got as a child, and that is the reason why probiotics, um, taking them as a supplement, Catherine, don't stay forever. You always want to revert back to your original fingerprint. Okay. The body wants that. It likes that balance. Okay, great. So I've moved on from the, the last slide of the questions and answers just to put up for you some um, resources that are available on cdhf.ca. So we're actually in the middle of producing a four-part part video series on the microbiome, and hopefully most of you have already seen the first one, which is introducing your microbiome. We have a section on the website called Love Your Tummy, and there's information on probiotics there. So that's pretty much the end of our session. We want to thank you very much, Dr. Fedoric, for sharing your insights and expertise with us, Danan and the group at, from Activita for supporting our event, and of course you for joining us. We hope that our Meet Your Microbiome presentation has empowered you to better understand the human gut microbiome, learn how to protect and enhance your own microbiome, think about how the microbiome may influence your own health care in the future through the three Ps, and consider how an unhealthy microbiome may impact your health. This is the end. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Catherine.